Welcome to the System Simplified Podcast, where we feature top leaders who share stories on how to successfully systemize a business. Now, let's get started with the show. Hello, Adit Levitt here, the host of the System Simplified Podcast, where I feature top founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders about systematizing a business. And today's episode is being brought to you by Business Success Consulting Group where we create, document, and implement processes and procedures so businesses can grow and thrive. And today's guest is actually coming to us all the way from Australia, and it's Damien Carnahan. Hi, Damien. Hi, how are you going? Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. I'm excited to have you on. So we met through an entrepreneur organization that we both belong to which Correct. is a great organization. And I had many guests from EO on this podcast. And I'm really excited about our conversation because we're going to, you know, we're all about processes and we're going to talk here about the customer, the end-to-end -end customer journey, which is always a gr of great interest to me and a great subject to talk about because that really ties in very well into processes and procedures. So we're going to talk about it from your aspect and, it's great. I have a lot of questions. So, but first of we'll, all, we'll connect all the we'll connect all the dots. Yes, exactly. We're going to connect the dots. That's absolutely true. But let me introduce you first, like with the with the formal bio, and then we start our conversation. So, That's Damien, great. you are the founder and CEO of Proto Partners, and you are a leading service design consultancy, and you are based in Australia, as I said, and you have a pioneering approach to service design. So you significantly contributed to enhancing customer experiences across various sectors, including public transport and banking. And that's very important. You know, it's the customer experience, you know, enhancing that and making it better is very, very important, as we know. And your expertise lies in bridging the gap between customer expectations and service delivery, thereby transforming how business interact with their clients. So, you know, you've done a lot of innovative work in prototyping services like Sydney Metro Project, Showcase, and sh Showcase is your commitment to creating surprisingly easy end-to-end -end journeys for customers, right? So it's the customer journey, making it easy, bridging the, gra the gap between expectations, what's needed, and the actual delivery. And that's a key component in any any delivery process, any operational process, because obviously the process has to be as good as we actually delivering to our clients what they want. Yeah, totally. And quite often it's not. Uh, I think Bain several years ago now did a did a survey. They surveyed 353 global CEOs and they asked them, you know, do you deliver a, a, a good a superior service experience? Um, and 88% of those CEOs said, yes, we deliver a superior customer experience for our, for our customers. They then went and asked those same customers of those CEOs of their businesses, well, what do you think? And they, and only 8% agreed. So you have this eight? 88, eight, I should say for Americans, eight, it's 88 versus eight. <laughs> so we've got an 80 point gap. Now, Ernst and Young. So what is that? Is that like a perception? Of a well, it's a perception, yeah. So what you've got, what you've got going on, I think it's a really interesting conversation. This can be because the journey or the the promise that we say brand is the promise you make, customer experience is the promise you keep. Businesses are exceptional at making promises to their customers. Marketing teams are fantastic. The advertising is fantastic. They make all organizations make all these promises to get you in the door. The question yeah, it is sounds like politics. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's pretty close. The question is, once you make those promises, who's responsible for keeping them? And it's interesting when you look at a business, there's lots of people responsible for bringing people in the door, but there's quite often rarely somebody who's responsible for the end of end, end to end service delivery and making sure you deliver those promises. And so that's what we do. We go into businesses and we understand what are the promises you make? What are the expectations your customers have as a result of that? And how are you doing? How are you doing at actually delivering that? And then if you're not keeping up to those promises or the, those levels of expectations, how do we help you um, understand what they are, 
understand that they're important, clarify what's important, and then go deliver them um, and do that on a, a repeatable, sustainable basis, which is where your type of business comes in. Because quite often we're doing the strategic layer of it, and then maybe one down, but it sounds like in talking to you, you um, before we got started and, and, and previously, that you then take that and then embed that and make sure that happens every single day. And I think exactly. that's the difference. That's the difference between like a product design and a service design. If I take here's my is my iPhone, everyone's got an iPhone or a phone. This has to work every time it comes out of a factory. Otherwise, we send it back, and they have to give us a new one. And three thousand dollars or two thousand dollars goes down the drain. If you get a glass of water, this has to hold the water, and it has to work thousands of times. That's not the same with services, and the majority of businesses in the first world, 70, 75% of it of GDP in America, Europe, England, Australia, Asia, are service products. And day in, day out, businesses launch new service products which are broken because they don't work 100% of the time as expected, as promised every single day, day in, day out. And if you think, and and you just think about um your telco experience or insurance, how many times do people go, oh, my telco or my insurance company or my medical, what that is is a broken service product. It isn't, it hasn't been designed properly to work every single time. So that's what we do. Absolutely. And I agree with you. It's it's the it's a great analogy. I mean the the glass of water will always hold the water will hold the water. That's the product we are getting here. But we have to do the same thing with service as well. And that's where well-documented processes come into place. But the strategy on how to do it is what comes first. So tell me, what is your approach for when you approach a customer designing um, a client journey, end-to-end -end yeah. client journey, right? What are the main key components that have to be there for it to be a workable process? Yeah, great question. So. First, I think people come to us and they have a sense of what's wrong. They, they know that they've got customer churn, they're not keeping up with their competitors, they're losing out on sales, they're not growing as fast as they could. So they understand that they want to solve those business problems. Quite often, they don't have a really good sense of what's going wrong. So we help them actually work out what we're going to go solve. And we do that through deep levels of research. Now, everybody's heard of focus groups. So we don't do those. I mean, focus groups are you put eight people in a room and say, well, what do you think? What we're doing is about seven or eight different types of research over a five or six, seven week period to surround the customer and really understand it. So we'll take their original research. We'll take their net promoter score or customer satisfaction scores. We'll take their complaint data. We'll do social media reviews. We will do 15 to 20 customer interviews. We will do stakeholder interviews. We will interview front-facing staff. Uh, we might interview people, partners. So we're surrounding the problem. And what that does is helps them understand the problems that they're facing um, in a far more uh, granular and more rigorous way. And what in typically happens is the result of that is they think they have a small problem. And after we get in and we do the research, they realize that it's far wider spread, far more systemic and far deeper and far worse than they actually thought. And so, so what are some examples of those problems that you encounter, mm -hmm. like what would be an example or several examples of yeah, those? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. So we're working with a, um, a company which um, when you buy and sell a house, um, it, uh, the settlement. So when you buy the house and you've got to pay the money and you settle it, it's a, it e settles, it's electronically settled. So there's no physical exchange of checks anymore. There's just this thing. So it works with, uh, solicitors and lawyers and conveyances to, to bring all that together in a seamless way. Well, that's actually far more. And what this organization we're trying to do a break into the market against a well-established competitor. Now they had really had really really nice technology, but it wasn't easy to use and it wasn't easy to um, to to buy because it wasn't easy to onboard. So I'm using an established type of product, and I've got this new competitor who wants to come in, and it's probably superior technology, but the onboarding process and the 
the ramping up process is incredibly difficult and it's not intuitive and it's not biocentric. And so what they had is this exceptional product, but people weren't getting to use it because they go, this is just too hard. You're making it too hard for me to actually get going. And so they weren't able to grow as quickly as possible because people would stop. They just look at it and go, well, there's no onboarding. Um, there's no assistance. There's no support. There's nothing to help me get into it. And so as a result, they were losing a lot of sales. So what we help them do is go, how do we help your potential new customers buy this? How do we explain this in bite-sized chunks and only give them the information they need at the time rather than foisting it all upon them at the same time so they gradually get into it and realize and make it a, a lot easier. So that that's one. Another one is Sydney Metro. It's, it's a driverless train, which uh, comes from the top of Sydney to the center of Sydney. That's a, the simplest way of doing it. Now, and the, and the top half of Sydney is like an LA, I suppose, or maybe even Florida. People drive. So the public, there wasn't public transport there or minimal public transport. They were driving from 30, 40 kilometers away into the central business district and parking. So they were going to introduce a train. They were spending $24 billion on the product. And then they came to us and said, we don't understand the service experience. We did research. And what we found was a really big unlock for them. They were focused on um, how do we get people on the metro? Like how do we get people from outer, outer suburbs to want to catch the train into the city? That was the construct or the frame they came. When we started talking to customers, they said, that's not my concern. Getting on a train in the morning and getting into the city, I think will be really, really easy. What I'm more concerned about is on the way home, when I catch the train back out, will there be buses or other transport to help me get back to my house? And if I can't do that, I'm not even going to get on the train in the beginning. And so they were at that time focused on getting, saying, hey, catch the train into the city. But that was the wrong emphasis because people weren't worried about that. That wasn't the most important thing. The insight was, how do I get door? They were thinking from door to door. We said, we introduced the concept from, how do we go from door to door to door? And that was the unlock. And so therefore they started communicating and all the messaging and advertising was, when you get back, there will be shops at the end, there will be buses at the end, you can pick up your dry cleaning, you can pick up your dinner, you can all those things that you need. That was the thing that unlocked the travel and that the, the, the visitation or the usage of that has really increased significantly. So there's just two quite different examples, but it goes to show when you truly understand the problem deeply, it opens up a range of options on how to solve it. And I think too often organizations have a very shallow understanding of the problem or they think they understand the problem. And then they go, they rush to solutions because everybody loves action. Everyone just loves, let's, you know, it's quick wins, quick wins, quick wins. Let's, let's do stuff. But quite often they're spending time and effort on the things which aren't that important to their customers. So we help people understand what's most important to their customers, prioritize that and deliver it so it works. That makes sense. I mean, that's a simple process of that our listeners can definitely learn from is do that research, you know, find out, ask the questions, research and find the actual problem and then fix that. So what are the, some of the examples of fixing or creating an optimal customer end-to-end -end client journey? Yeah, so some of the, the things, so once you, and whether you do as much research as us, but yeah, I would encourage if you're a smaller business, certainly a small or medium-sized business, certainly going out and talking to your customers. Even if you did nine or 10 interviews, you'd have a much deeper understanding of that. And if you're doing net promoter score or customer satisfaction or customer feedback research, combining that, and then going through that and understanding what are the most important um, things to your customers. The way you can do that is to build what's called a customer journey. So people are very familiar with process maps. A process map is an inside out view of the way a process works. It's, it's quite often it's theoretical. It should be realistic, but it's a theoretical. This is the way the process should work. What's even more valuable is to match that and go outside and do a customer journey, which maps from a customer's perspective, the way it actually works. So you might think that we're going to deliver a credit card in a particular way. Then you go speak to a customer and go, well, 
how does it actually work? And they will have a, a total, a, not a total, but they'll have a different journey of how they interact and perceive that, um, that experience. And when you do that, you can match the two up. You can say, when you go outside and go, well, this is the way the customer thinks. I, I think we're actually delivering the credit card really, really quickly. But then you go speak to the customer and go, I have to wait two weeks for my credit card. So inside, you've got a process go, we deliver it in 14 days. You go to the customer and they go, I've got to wait two weeks for my credit card. Like, why can't I get it in seven days? There you've got a problem. So that allows you to, if we're going to dip into it, you, you should do that for all the key moments of your customer journey and map it to your process. But let's just say, okay, we've got 10 of those. Let's take that top one. Let's just say the 14 days, that's the biggest issue. So let's attack that one first and then understand that more deeply with customers. Go, well, why, what is it? Is it the 14 days? Is it the fact that you don't know that it's coming, that we don't communicate with you? And they may say, well, yeah, it's not actually the 14 days. I can wait. But nobody actually says anything to me. So there's this void of information. So I'm I'm not sure. And then I become anxious. And then I call your call center and you go, oh, okay, how many days would be okay? Well, if I knew it was coming, I'd be okay with 10 days. You go, great. Okay. So you could then send out some communication and it's probably cheaper to do that than expedite the credit card from 14 down to seven. And I'm just giving an example, but it's a, an example of trade-offs. How do you trade off? We're very realistic in our customer experience in terms of it's not all about people say we need to delight the customer. I think that's a crock of whatever, you know, I, I think you have to meet customer expectations. Uh, there's lots of research I could go into it, which say, if you just meet customer expectations, that's 90% of the job done. Um, delighting is cherry on top, but there are there's so many problems that if you just focus on what understand in detail what their expectations are and meet them. Don't have but to you go over the top. You can exceed expectations, but doesn't mean that you have to. It's all, in my opinion, I mean, I hear you and I think it's a great, great, um, you make excellent points, but I think if, if, if you really understand what the expectations are and you meet or ex and you can then exceed them as well because you understand what is expected, right? Because sometimes you feel like you're exceeding expectations, but you don't even know what's ex expected, right? Because I think the way, I mean, the way I look at it, and I, I'm glad you mentioned process mapping. I mean, that's what we do. And then you do the customer journey and that's where the two dots connect, right? Yes. But let's say, for instance, if customers are expecting that, um, you know, like you, you mentioned the, the example with the Sydney Metro. Okay, so they, they basically are worrying about how they're going to get home, right? But if you then know that that's what they're expecting and delivering it, and then you come up with some bright idea of how to actually exceed the expectations, maybe, you know, open, you know, survey what stores would they like to have there and then have those stores. Or maybe they want parking places like, you know, the park and ride that you have here in the U.S. Right. You know? sure. So maybe you can advertise then mm -hmm. it, it's actually very safe. There are lights, there is security, and there is like, you know, very clean and open spaces. Whatever it is, you can always take it the next level. But Absolutely. I think it, yeah. it, is, it takes the guesswork, right? Because I'm thinking I'm going to delight my customers by doing this and this, but it's not even what they are expecting. So if you know what they're expecting, you can always take it to the next level and make it more. Absolutely. Appealing. Absolutely. And, yeah. and and we're not saying just do a stodgy job. Yeah. You, you, you've explained it really, really well. Yeah. Once you understand what's important, they don't want a gift card. They don't want you to wish them happy birthday. They just want to get home quickly and easily with dinner under their arm you know, um, to, to feed the family. And so you're right. Once you understand that that's the important thing, then you can double down on it and really actually give that experience something special because that's what they really value as opposed to getting on the train. So in the morning, they don't care about croissants. What they care about is the roast chicken at night. So we have chicken shops, not, you know, uh, boulangeries in the morning, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I agree. That's that that is it's the key. It's the key. I think what you are mentioning, Damien, is really the communication. Because you are in communication with your customers, with your clients, you understand what they want and you provide it to them. So that way they are feeling heard. You're not guessing. And I think like that was shocking that 88% of the of the CEOs will say, yes, we are delighting our customers, and the customers only 8%. That's really a big disconnect, right? Well, that, so, that that research was 10 years ago. Ernst & Young did it two years ago, and the data was 78 and 11. 
So wow. it hasn't changed that much. It hasn't changed that much. So what did you say that like one of the things like to like part of that? So yeah, you know, you have to understand what they want. You have to create a process so it will actually be delivered every single time. But I think part of that process should also be survey. I mean, that those companies should survey their customers on a regular basis to make sure that they're actually getting that the expectations are being met. So it's not such a such a divergence in opinions, right? Absolutely. And so things change. I mean, the way we think about the world now is quite different than it was three years ago. And we all know why that's happened. And the emphasis on what is important for us is different. And I think you bring up a good point that ongoing surveys out to customers, it's important to do that. It's even more important to actually take the time to analyze them. And a lot of companies do that and they look at it on a surface level. But if you actually take that in combination with interviews, like you see their feedback and then ask them some more questions, that allows you to keep on uncovering the next most important thing um, that you can that you can go about solving, and that that becomes that becomes important. I agree absolutely. It's analyze it and take action, right? So that's definitely very yeah. Very and I, I just want to say one more thing. A lot of a lot of times, customers will talk to customers and they'll say, "Yes, we know our customers." In fact, nine times out of ten, organizations that we initially talk to say, "I know our customers." And I go, it's George or the Sarah and they're 50 and they buy this type of product and they've been with me for 40 years. We're not talking about that. We know you know that's demographic information. What we're talking about is what's important to them? What isn't important to them? What's their highest priority? What's their least priority? What do they get disappointed about? What are their expectations? How do you compare to all of those? And I guarantee you that 98 out of 100 country, uh, companies do not know the answers to those questions. And they are the questions which help you differentiate in a service-based product business as opposed to selling a cup, you know? And, you know, I guess I know I like it flute-based versus straight-based. That's a very different thing than customer emotions and uh, human emotions. Absolutely. I agree. I totally agree. Damien, this is amazing information. If people want to know more about you, and broader partners, how, what, where would they go? Easy, just go to, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Damien Kernahan. I post uh, videos every single day, or they can go to protopartners.com.au um, or just Proto CX, uh, any of those. Um, I'm, I'm everywhere all over the net, so they'll find me and happy to, uh, to answer any questions that anybody has. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on this podcast. Very Thank great you. conversation, great process that we laid out about how to make sure you understand your clients' expectations and what to do with it. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the System Simplified podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.